Hello, everybody. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Marco Baylog, and I will be moderating tonight's debate. As I'm sure you know, the topic of this debate and discussion is the existence of the supernatural. Before we begin, we have a short statement from the Freethinkers of Portland State, the sponsors of this event. Please give your attention to Freethinkers co-president, Addie Lass. I think we established that this microphone works. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Like he said, my name is Addie, and I am the co-president of the Freethinkers of Portland State University. The purpose of our student group is to promote critical thinking here on campus and to provide a secular voice for students here. If you'd like to know more about our group, I'm definitely available to answer questions after the event. The Freethinkers is comprised of a variety of non-believers, many of whom think that there is no such thing as supernatural. Some may see this as not being very open-minded and, well, not being a free thinker who thinks freely. <clears throat> According to Merriam-Webster, Merriam the term open-minded means willing to consider different ideas or opinions. It does not state that you must be willing to accept all ideas, regardless of the amount of evidence. And while sometimes we don't always want to hear other people's opinions, even though they do give us the chance to deepen our understanding. As free thinkers, we are willing to consider the possibility that the supernatural exists, as long as there is empirical evidence to support such a claim. However, at the present time, no empirical evidence has been presented to show the existence of anything supernatural. When someone claims something is supernatural, they are stating that they can't explain something. Therefore, they can explain it. Or we, <laughs> we think that it is better to say, I don't know, but let's try and figure it out, rather than to claim to know the answer to something we don't fully understand. Humans throughout history have claimed a wide variety of things to be supernatural in origin. Science has discovered many of this, these phenomena to be natural occurrences. The spread of diseases, weather, natural disasters, and the alignment of the stars were all once described using supernatural explanations. Experts, laypersons alike, now know that we can track the spread of diseases, whether it's the result of atmospheric changes, natural disasters have causes that are well understood, and the alignment of the stars are simply just patterns we once created for our own survival. Tonight, I hope that you take into consideration both sides of the argument and make your own conclusions based on the evidence. And again, thank you for attending the event, and I hope you enjoy. Thank you, Addie. We originally wanted a religious student group to also make a statement, but we could not find any that wanted to, at least at PSU. Um, at this point, we welcome anyone from the audience who would like to make a brief statement or testimonial explaining why they became religious or why they left religion. If you could just come up and grab this microphone, that would be great. Sure. And you have three to five minutes, does that work? Thank you. My name is Mike Fishkin. I come from a Jewish background. You can tell from my accents shortly, or maybe you've already picked it up, that I grew up in New York City. Uh, I became an atheist at the age of 12 and a half. Uh, I'm an older guy. Uh, that was in 1956. Um, after watching film of uh, World War II and seeing these new huge mounds of bodies being bulldozed into graves. Um, I said to my friends walking to Hebrew school, I remember it vividly, uh, walking down there, that if God ever existed, he must have died because a loving God, I couldn't imagine allowing women and children to be executed like that and put to death like that. And uh, I said, I'd, I'd go through with my bar mitzvah. It, we'd study for about four years. Anyhow, you know, just for my parents' sake and stuff like that. And, and I did. Um, and so I was atheistic. At that point, I said, I don't believe in God. And later on, I said, well, I should be more open-minded about the possibility of a God because I don't know everything. And uh, along the way, as I grew up, I went through school, got my master's degree in business and successful different jobs at top four, top 50 companies, uh, moving up the ladder, the corporate ladder. But wondering about life and saying, is this 
all there is, you know, waiting for the weekend pretty much to, <laughs> to have fun. Um, and the Beatles were big back then in the 60s, and, uh, and so was drugs. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, to make a long story short, um, well, I got into checking out Eastern religion. I'm a reader. I read lots and lots of stuff. And um, I, uh, excuse me. Um, I'm used to speaking, but I'm not used to speaking in this kind of setting. Uh, I had, it was a long, strange trip, you know, you could say, um, in, in a spiritual journey. I, I did a lot of research, starting in psychology, Carl Jung. Um, Moving on, he got into throwing the I Ching, on into many other things. You know, back then, um, Timothy Leary here in the West Coast, there was Ken Kesey. Uh, in any case, the mind, wondering about the mind and what happened in the mind, Einstein said, we only use 15%, well, excuse me, he said about 15% of our brain is unknown in terms of usage back then, when I was younger. And, I, you know, I always wondered about the extra sensory perceptions, the possibility of that. Of course, Einstein would be in the supernatural camp, uh, along with most of his favorite scientists. He was a deist, he was not a theist, but he said that his goal in life was to figure out how the creator made everything, and everything else he said was detail. So he believed in a creator making everything. His three favorite scientists, I didn't know this growing up, I see a guy shaking his head, but it's true, you can check it out. Um, his three favorite scientists, uh, his, their pictures up on his study wall were Michael Faraday, James Kirk Maxwell, and his favorite was Sir Isaac Newton, who were all Christians. And they would hold debates. They would, they would argue with uh, atheists of their day and, and skeptics of their day um, about why the evidence supported God. And true science supports God, as Bart Rask has, I'm sure, aptly shown in the past here, and, and many others, for those of you who are interested. Um, for me, uh, I started to, you know, look at different things in Buddhism, Eastern religion, and I was sharing with my doctor, who was Jewish, he'd become a Christian. I, I, I was about 27 then. He'd been my family doctor since I was 11, and I didn't know he'd become a Christian. And uh, he mentioned some prophecy. I was sharing prophecy with him of Edgar Casey and Nostradamus, most of you. That guy back there probably knows who they are. But some of you know, because he's been naughty right along with some names. And if you could please get to your point. Yeah, your point. I'm sorry. Um, I started reading scripture. I got high that day. And I said, if you have anything to do with this, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna rip it apart like I tend to do. I really want to see if it's true. If you're up there and this is your, you know, your book, I had started to believe that there was something besides the material world based on reading Siddhartha and Buddhism and Upanishads of Bhagavadim, Bhagavad Gita as well. And I started reading the New Testament. I was got blown away by Jesus' words. Einstein said that man's problems are moral problems, and they require a moral solution. He said tech, science and technology will never resolve moral problems. And he said there's two men who can answer all the moral problems. If we follow what they said, all moral problems would disappear. Moses was one, and Jesus was the other, he said. I think I know why he said that. But he said no one ever spoke as divinely as this man Jesus. When I started reading the New Testament, I got blown away. I started crying somewhere in Matthew. I knew a lot of the Old Testament, being Jewish, because I've been searching for a long time. I said I've read, you know, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, you know, I'm a, I'm a reader, I'm winding up here. Prophecies are what? Einstein's three, five, and this is, where's that girl who's speaking there? Anyhow, Maddie. Um, the empirical evidence, um, there, well, for two things. Uh, first, we know Jesus existed because my fellow Jews wrote about him in the Talmud, said he was put to death because he was leading Israel astray with his sorcery. So they're testifying to his existence and testifying to his miracles that they call sorcery. Tacitus, the Roman historian, writing around 90-something AD, and Pliny the Younger. By the way, if you're really interested in all this stuff, you can find it at truthseekers.ws. Write it down if, you, if you're really interested. Um, but the evidence is there, and it's prof I'm going to wind this up right now. The, it's prophetic evidence. Um, the historical evidence is right there, because they would have denied it even existed, my fellow rabbis. 
fellow Jews in, in, as well as the Romans, but they had to say he was there. And so when you look at the prophecies, such as in Isaiah 53, it's in the Dead Sea Scroll, it says someone's going to come and die. For, he's going to die. Jesus said, I'm that guy. I'm here to die. He's going to be a new covenant, taking over the covenant, the old covenant that Moses gave. And he said, I'm that covenant. He's the first guy to figure that out. So he's such a genius. So as, as C.S. Lewis said, he's the Lord, liar, and lunatic to figure all that stuff out. And Excuse me, Mike. I'm, I'm, yeah. yeah. You better and, move on. They were, he, so he was willing to die. He said, he's, I'm here to die. A guy who's 27, 30 years old doesn't generally do that. Um, check out the prophecy. All these prophecies are given. Someone's going to come and die, be a new covenant. I'm wrapping it up right now. 30 seconds. Um, he's going to be a new covenant. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's going to die. He's going to be raised from the dead. He had to convince people of that. And he had to fulfill stuff. He had to heal the blind, the lame, and the deaf, which is shown in Isaiah 35, and did all that, convinced people so much that they were willing to die for what they had seen. They were interviewed by, I'm sure, by Pliny and Tacitus, the Roman historians. I said, thank you for giving me extra time, but I, I am long-winded to get on TV sometimes. Thank Just you, Mike. Me. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. This debate is meant to be an exposition of the two responses to the question, does anything supernatural exist? Representing the yes response on my left is Phil Smith, professor of philosophy and chair of the Department of Religious Studies at George Fox University. Phil Smith got his PhD in philosophy from the University of Oregon in 1991 and has been a full-time professor since 1992. He has several published works, including Being Home at the World, a New Christian Apologetic, and recently, Why Faith is a Virtue. On the side answering no is Bernie Daler, a certified humanist minister with a master's degree in ministry. Bernie founded the Center for Philosophical Naturalism in order to promote a naturalistic worldview. We will now give each presenter 10 minutes to present their arguments, and then they will be given 10 minutes to respond to the other's arguments. They are free to ask each other questions during their responses. After that, we will begin our Q&A session. Yeah. Ten minutes for the initial presentation and then ten for the response. I believe. Yeah, it's very short. Yeah. It is, it is ten minutes. It's, it's twenty for both speakers. Sorry. Uh, Bernie Daler will go first. Well, Bernie, you have ten minutes. Okay, I'm sure this thing's on. Hello, everybody. Okay, good. Okay. So, does anything supernatural exist? My short answer is, I think there's a 0% chance of anything supernatural existing, but I'm also 100% open-minded and willing to logically consider any evidence. So, I might be totally wrong, but I think 100% there's no chance of anything supernatural existing but I'm totally open-minded. If you have some good evidence, let's talk about it. The core of my message today is showing some of the differences between scientific thinking and magical thinking. I look again at scientific thinking. I'm not saying science versus religion. I'm saying scientific thinking versus magical thinking. And magical thinking is a lot of religious thinking because a lot of religions go into the supernatural. Some uh, religions might be atheistic, such as Buddhism. There's some certain strains of Buddhism, but most of them have some uh, element of supernatural and magical thinking. So what does supernatural mean? It's a good thing to ask since we're asking the question. And it best means something beyond the natural. So for example, uh, you know, as far as we know, nobody can tell the future, but people claim to do that through magic and special powers. For example, uh, using a crystal ball, tarot cards, which a Christian would probably say is, you know, using the evil forces, uh, satanic forces. Uh, astrology, which means looking at the stars, and uh, you can tell your future from looking at the stars and based on where you're born, when you were born. And even, you know, reading tea leaves or coffee grounds, you can tell the future. And of course, somebody came up with the Bible. There's a Bible code. You can look into the Bible if you know how to, you know, if you know the Bible code, and you can see maybe what's in store for you. Now to bring it more specifically too, uh, what about ghosts? Um, there's haunted houses everywhere and theme parks. I was in Disneyland a few weeks ago and of course there's a famous haunted mansion there. Universal Studios has a haunted museum. Oaks Park locally has a haunted house. 
But how many haunted houses are there that science is studying? There's zero. There's no scientific papers written on them because when the scientists get out there and rigorously study these, there's nothing there to report on. So think about that. All over the world, there's not one scientifically studied house, haunted house, but yet everybody believes in ghosts and haunted houses and every amusement park has them. So, you know, just consider that. Why I'm wearing this t-shirt, um, part of it is kind of some levity, but also I, I want to, you know, make the point that, you know, nobody believes in this kind of ghost, but, you know, the Bible, the uh, King James Version talks about the Holy Ghost, you know, what people say the Holy Spirit too, and, you know, uh, Christians believe Jesus is in heaven right now. See, for me, that's all imagination. Jesus exists only in your imagination. The Holy Ghost only exists in your imagination, just like this ghost. And that's the point I'm trying to make. I'm not making fun of the Holy Ghost. I'm just saying that's what I actually believe. Uh, sometimes people think atheists really believe in God. They just don't want to serve, serve him. No, I don't believe he exists at all. Um, and one, one thing that's interesting, too, is uh, the Noah's Ark story. Uh, Christians don't talk about Noah's Ark because it's very divisive. Uh, for example, Vern here just put out a campus uh, invitation here to learn about why the worldwide flood is true. Okay, so most academics would say that's nonsense scientifically, so they would back up and say, how about a local flood? Maybe there was a local flood that wiped out, wiped out all the humans. Well, that doesn't make sense, because why would humans be in a local area, and why would you say birds? You know, birds could easily fly away. Why would you say birds? So some Christians will accept all of modern science and say, well, the whole thing is a myth. And this is something I'd like to, you know, Phil to address today. Can he come out and say that it's a myth? Because if he says it's a local flood or a global flood, it really shows there's, there's some kind of scientific reasoning problem. Either he doesn't know the facts or he can't reason correctly. And if he says it's a myth, he's going to alienate most Christians. So I'd really like to have Phil answer later, what does he, how does he interpret the... the Noah's Ark. Is it a global flood, local flood, or a myth? Uh, I'd really like to get that out of him today. William Lane Craig is a premier um, debater for Christians, and he, he tries to avoid the topic. You know, let's not even talk about that. It has nothing to do with the existence of God. And, you know, if I'm pushed in the corner, I believe in a local flood, he says. So that shows some nonsense on his point for going for the local flood, I believe. Uh, and by the way, you know, the Bible says, Lo, I live. Noah lived to 950 years old. I think that's kind of an interesting thing, you know, trying to reconcile that with modern knowledge. So one way to answer any question I think is true with critical thinking. Uh, this is a textbook that they offer. A lot of colleges teach on critical thinking, and this, this will change your life. And uh, it says how to think about weird things because there's a lot of weird things out there like Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster, spontaneous human combustion, creationism. I mean, that's in here too. So. They talk about how to look at different hypotheses and how to rank them and how to judge them. It's a really good book. So critical thinking involves both an attitude and a process. That's one of my major points. On the attitude part, there's intellectual honesty, intellectual courage. Intellectual honesty means facing the truth. Uh, don't say like, oh, I, I have this belief and anything that confirms it, I'm going to hold on to that and push that to other people and if anything disconfirms it, I'm going to put that in a box and forget about it. There's people who literally do that. They write down their doubts. I heard this question about a Mormon bishop. He writes his doubts in a little card, puts it in the box, and forgets about it. That's how he deals with it. That's not being intellectually honest. Intellectual courage means face your fear that you might be wrong. Don't defend your faith at any cost. Uh, be willing to change, whether you're an atheist or a Christian. Just, you know, seek the truth is the biggest thing. Now, critical thinking involves a lot of different things, like learning about deductive logic, inductive logic, and all that. But one thing that's easy to learn and kind of fun to learn and can really help you a lot is called logical fallacies. And these are things that um, make logic go off the rails, basically. And people have these logical fallacies, and so they draw wrong conclusions. So as a background, um, this is before we even get into logical fallacies, one thing that's really interesting to know is called the burden of proof. That means when you propose a hypothesis, such as there's a God and he wants you to receive him into your heart or something, you should ask for evidence for that. And if they say, well, can you disprove me? You say, it's not my job to disprove you. If you're going to come with a claim, you need to have evidence for that. Especially if you're going to demand things from me, like change my entire life because of this belief system, 
give me some evidence. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The more you ask of somebody, the more evidence you have to give. And then there's the null hypothesis, which means uh, the starting point. So the starting point is we all agree there's a national, uh, a natural world. If you want to go beyond that and say there's also a supernatural world, you need to bring some evidence to uh, to show that. It's kind of like if you say I have a pill that a pill that will cure cancer. Well, the null hypothesis is that pill does not work, and so you have to prove with double-blind tests that you have more effectiveness than a placebo. And that's how you beat the null hypothesis, for example. So it's the same thing with any argument. Whoops. Um, so here's some of the top five arguments that, that I see in God debates. This is the biggest one by far, is the appeal to emotion. William Lane Craig, for example, says, I know God exists because I feel him in my heart. Uh, that's the internal witness. And then my proofs for God are just an external I'm trying to prove to you externally, and if I fail, I'm sorry, but I know God exists, not because of those external proofs, but because of my heart. So the point is, emotions, you can't determine truth by emotions. Ask anybody who was cheated on, or swindled, or fooled, or anything. You just cannot determine truth by your emotions. It's a failed epistemology. Epistemology is a way of gaining knowledge. And, you know, Mormons will say, too, hey, pray about the Book of Mormon, and if it's true, God will, you know, ask God to send you a, a feeling. Well, I did that when I was a Christian. I was debating Mormons, and I got the feeling. But, so I was a Mormon for about five seconds, because my brain came on and said, wait a minute, you can't believe this with what you know. So, you know, this, this might be a typical trick. Another one is the uh, argument for ignorance. Where did everything come from, Big Bang? Where did the Big Bang come from? Where did the laws of nature come from? I don't know. Well, if you don't know, that's evidence for God. No, it's not. We don't know. That's not evidence for God. How did life come from non-life? I don't know. That's evidence for God. No, it's not. It's not evidence for God. Um, the cum cumulative case for God is like, well, okay, maybe if you say we don't know who created the universe, and we don't know how life came from non-life, but when you put all these together, you now you have a cumulative case and it makes it more likely. No, it doesn't. They're all individually no good, but a hundred of them together, they're still no good. I know Phil likes the cumulative case for God, so this is going to be one of our discussion points, probably. The ontological argument for God is God is the best at everything, so he's got to be um, all-knowing, for example, but if he's all-knowing, he'd be bored to death because he can't even create anything. He already knows how everything's going to be. It'd be torture if you knew everything. You can't even investigate anything because you already know it. So, just to summarize, that I'd like you to make a commitment to seek the truth, regardless of where it leads, because nobody can put you down for following the truth. And it may cost you something, it may cost you personal relationships, but. I'll leave it with that. Thank you. Very much. Thank you, Bernie. Um, Dr. Smith, you now have 10 minutes for your presentation. Okay, before I uh, launch into my discussion, I want to agree with Bernie on a couple things. Um, if you're going to be a philosopher, uh, you have to appeal to uh, reasons that are open to anybody. So I'm not going to make any appeals to special books or the authority of the tradition or whatever. Um, and to make this point more emphatic, uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Mark McLeod Harrison, with whom I wrote uh, Being at Home in the World, which is an apologetics book. Um, he likes to get students' attention because he knows they come from nice conservative Christian churches. And he says, look, if Christianity isn't true, Jesus doesn't want you to believe it. Yeah, so we gotta be committed to the truth. Um, so I'm emphatically with uh, Bernie on this. Uh, he, he listed some uh, intellectual virtues of open-mindedness and critical thinking and following the evidence, that's where we should be. So uh, there's no question about our agreement on some things. Also, I want to say, I'm trying to get this thing to the full screen version. 
what a, we'll, we'll leave with, we'll live with it the way it is. Um, I want to say also thank, say thank you to Bernie for uh, inviting me into this whole thing. It's lots of fun. Um, anytime you get to do philosophy in public, it's kind of like exposing yourself. It's kind of fun. All right. Um, uh, well, it depends on what kind of exposure. What are you expecting? What is wrong with you people? Okay. Um, this is a brief in invitation, not a knockdown argument. I don't like knockdown arguments, and I don't think you can give one even in 20 minutes. I've took all 20 minutes. Um, First of all, what is naturalism? If I'm going to defend new supernaturalism, we have to ask what naturalism is. And there's an early, easy definition that you can find anywhere. Only the natural world is real. And I think it's pretty clear that Bernie believes that. Okay? Notice, first of all, this is a metaphysical claim. All right? Um, because it talks about everything. When you talk about everything, that's metaphysics. He said earlier, we all agree that the natural world is real. Actually, some people don't, you know. There are some metaphysicians who call themselves idealists, and they think the natural world is a bunch of, um, um, what, what should we say, misleading. It's not real. I'm not an idealist, but we, we shouldn't just write, write them out of the question. Can we be a little more precise? I mean, to just say that naturalism says that everything that is, exists is natural, we need something more. I mean, fill in the details. And so we could say naturalists believe in comets and quarks and, uh, you know, dinosaurs. Well, that's just giving us examples. Then they will say, well, we don't believe in God or spirits or miracles or incarnation, reincarnation or answered prayer. Okay, but the problem with that is it's a negative definition. You always learn in your introductory logic class you have to give a positive definition if you possibly can. And the key thing here is what is nature? Uh, especially since, you know, there are so many, we used to have a nice, clear definition of nature. Nature is matter. Yeah, but then we learned about, you know, energy and matter and uh, gravity waves, and it gets a lot more complicated. So what is this nature? Um, here's a nice example of the problem that I'm kind of hinting at here. Um, in the very recent, very popular remake of the Cosmos series, which is just great television, by the way, you ought to be watching it, um, we start off with Carl Sagan. The cosmos is all that is or was or ever will be. Metaphysics, folks. And then the rest of the program just kind of like jerk you back and forth here. We do science the rest of the time. As if studying science proves a metaphysical claim. That's just a category mistake. That's just a simple category mistake. What is nature? Um, there's a suspicion when you listen to Bernie or you listen to the, the Cosmos series that people are confusing physics with metaphysics. That's just a category mistake. Does, and so let's, let's turn it over, let's push a little bit. Does science deliver all knowledge? Are there any non-natural truths? A non-natural truth would be something proven true or false, but not revealed by science. History of philosophy gives us many possible examples. Uh, Plato believed in the forms, true equality. In the Phaedo, we read, we measure this thing versus this thing. They seem to be equal. Are they really truly equal? No, they're not. Have we ever seen anything that's perfectly equal? No, we haven't. Where did we get this idea of perfect equality, says Plato, Socrates, actually. Um, well, it's a form. It doesn't exist in this world. Perfect triangles. And of course, the real forms that we're mostly interested in are not things like mathematical forms, but truth and beauty and justice and so forth. So Plato believed in non-natural truths. Marx, of all things, in the 19th century, introduced another non-natural truth, the idea of species being. After the revolution, when we um, get rid of the oppression of the workers, true humanity will emerge. True humanity does exist. Mark, Marx believed in it. Now, you don't have to believe in all of these. In fact, I don't believe in many of these so-called non-natural truths. But to not believe in them, you don't turn to a biologist or a physicist. You turn to good philosophy. More possible non-natural truths. Metaphysical doctrines, like idealism. I mean, Bernie just stated a while ago, we all believe in nature. Well, it's just false. The idealists don't believe in nature. So, I mean, we've got to... Uh, be a little more fair to, I'm not an idealist, but we've got to be careful and fair to these people. Um, dualism, everything that exists is both mental and physical. Naturalism, 
and we're still trying to figure out just what it is that the naturalists believe. Do they believe in gravity waves? Yes, they do. But you can't weigh them or measure them? Uh, well, we can't try to measure them. What about this one? Here's a different one. What about mathematical truths? Now, I know this is going to be disappointing to you and me. There are mathematicians out there thinking up new math, as if the fact, the fact that I couldn't get through trigonometry wasn't bad enough. I'm still trying to figure out what a cosine is, and they're coming up with new math. I mean, not the, you know, there was this big debate about the new math back in the 60s, how should we teach our kids? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about math research, where they're coming up with new stuff. All right, here's the question. When they come up with new stuff, do they invent it or discover it? It seems to me the naturalist has to say they invent it. It's all human made. But almost all mathematicians would tell you, no, 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 we're discovering stuff. When I, um, Newton and Leibniz simultaneously, as far as we can tell, historically speaking, in, uh, invented, invented, came up with, discovered, whatever, they came up with um, calculus at the same time. And uh, then they argued with each other who, who did it first. But they both said, we discovered it first. It was there before we got there. The truths of math. And of course, then there are moral truths, like stealing is wrong. I use that as an example because it's a famous example used by A.J. Ayer in the 1930s. Because A.J. Ayer was presenting a position very much, I believe, I very much like the natural implications of Bernie's position. Bernie ought to love A.J. Ayer. A.J. Ayer says stealing is wrong is neither true nor false. Because if it were true or false, it would be a non-natural truth. And there are no non-natural truths, so stealing is wrong is quite literally meaningless. So here are the naturalistic options as I can see. Number one, there are no non-natural truths. This is where Bernie braves it out. Um, eventually, science will answer all the important questions. This is the doctrine of logical positivism. We went through this in the 1940s and 1950s. Surely we should have learned a lesson, but we didn't. Positivism says only scientific statements are meaningful. It's just kind of like uh, epistemological imperialism. We have all the only words that count. Your words don't count, and we won't listen to you. Ignore all other things. Two, backing away from that view, there are no non-natural, well, this isn't backing away yet. This is applying, it to, applying positivism to morality, is the, the theory of emotivism. Emotivism is a theory famous in ethical theory, and I actually know something about ethical theory. That's my area of philosophy. Um, emotivism says that normative moral judgments merely express human preferences. Stealing is wrong merely means I don't like stealing, and I don't want you to like it either. This is the doctrine of Stevenson and all the other emotivists of the mid-20th century. The problem here is that positivism is self-refuting, and emotivism is false. And they've been dead in philosophy for 30 years. Three, explain how people can come to believe non-natural truths. Now, this is an important move, and it's kind of a cool thing in research right now in what I will call evolutionary epistemology. That is, human propensities to believe certain things pass the test of natural selection. I think that's kind of a cool theory. I think there's a lot of evidence for it, that we do have natural propensities to believe certain things. Unfortunately, this doesn't explain non-natural truths. The problem here is explain, explaining how we come to believe a thing does not explain whether or not that thing is true. For instance, to illustrate, let's imagine evolutionary uh, epistemology and religious beliefs. It is a fact that most people on earth believe in God or demons or some kind of religious stuff. And most evolutionary epistemologists would say, and certainly Bernie would say, they're all wrong. So there's a, just an interesting problem. Why is it that most of the human race is wrong in religious stuff? Well, the evolutionary epistemologist gives us a very plausible answer. We have evolved in a certain way so that these kind of beliefs help us to pass on our genes. If you could please wrap it up. OK, I will. I'm very close to the end. Um, but if that's true about something that is false, by Bernie's uh, proposition, then it might be true, it might be true also about our moral beliefs. You see the point? The evolutionary uh, epistemology explanation of why we believe a thing does not say whether or not it's true. The fourth option is that there, to admit that there are non-natural truths 
and that we have faculties that can discover them. Actually, I think Bernie, Bernie does believe this, but he doesn't understand that this contradicts his position. So he's moving along the right way. I mean, we've had pre previous conversations. We are the species that wonders, discovers theorems, and sins. Yeah, and they all, we'll, we'll feature in on that last one. Features of not some, not all, but some non-natural truths, I'm have moral to truths. You off after this. All right. Um, number number one, non-moral truths are non-natural. Moral truths are demanding. Moral truths are true, whether they are, what they are, whether you believe them or not. And then we have genuine guilt. Supernaturalism, supernaturalism explains these facts about non-natural, non-natural truths, and then the invitation, I have not given you a knockdown argument, even if I had been given another five minutes. Um, I wouldn't have tried to. This is an argument to the best explanation. How do we understand, how do we best explain the non-natural truths that we know are true about our moral obligations? We're open to alternate explanations. If you have an alternate explanation, that's good. That would be better. And of course, it's a holistic matter. You have to judge not just this one argument, many other arguments, both pro and against God. Bernie would insist, and I agree with him. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, we now have 10 minutes for Bernie to respond. During his response, he is free to ask questions of Dr. Smith, and Dr. Smith is free to speak freely in response. Okay, just to clarify, this is going to be an interaction, right? Um, yes. Could Phil have that microphone so we could interact? Yeah, actually, we really yeah, awkward. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and just also just to clarify, so um, this ten minutes, I'm going to be in the driver's seat, and it's I have the capability to interrupt Phil just to make sure that I want to. He's going down the line of path of reasoning that I want to take, and then when he has ten minutes, he has the same uh, driver's seat capability, you know, trying to get what he wants out of me. So that's just some background. Okay, Phil, I mean, this is something I'm really, uh, I mentioned in my discussion here about Noah's Ark, this is something I'm really fascinating I'd like to get out of you because in my experience, like I said, Christians are afraid to talk about this because it's so divisive and as a result of not talking about this, it lowers the intelligence of the entire Christian community because they cannot talk about this. So in the Christian community, you got people that believe in this younger and then something totally different, old earth, and then some of them totally agree 100% with modern science. Mm -hmm. So I would like to, to know from you, especially if you're a religious teacher, you teach theology at university, so you should be able to have an opinion on Noah's Ark, how to interpret that. That's right, I have an opinion. Okay. And I'll tell you. Okay. Ah, I'm not afraid. Okay. Um, I, I think the, the Noah's Ark story is a myth. Now, what does that mean? There are two meanings to the word myth, and we ought to be careful about them. Um, one is that it's a very large story that organizes people's belief. It's clearly a myth in that sense. You know, our students have to come to George Fox and they say, oh, the Bible is full of myths. Oh, no, that's terrible. Um, uh, well, Phil, Phil, I mean, okay. I, I, I want to I continue on, okay? okay. So basically, you just, you just say it's a myth. That means it's not literally true. It's, figurative, it's figurative uh, No, we're coming to the second meaning. The, on the second meaning, yes. On the first meaning, I was just trying to explain to people why they shouldn't be afraid of the word myth. But go ahead. Okay, let me let, me let you finish then. I, this, let's be clear about what, what a myth is. Go ahead. Can you just be real brief, though, because I want to ask you follow on. Right. So there, there are... A myth is a large story that organizes people. So, so the Marxist belief in a species being is part of a myth. Right. It's the, and there is the myth of autonomous reason that I attack in my, some of my books. So that's the one meaning of the word myth. Now, in terms of literal history, this is a typical meaning uh, of the word myth, in which case something is believed, widely believed, and, I don't be and it, it didn't happen. Uh, we have a friend here who thinks it's very important that we all believe that the myth was a literal, historical thing. I don't. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, what do you think about, do you think most Christians in the church, when you look at all, what do you consider to be real Christians, do you think most Christians would agree with you? In the pew? Probably not. Now, how do you explain that? People make mistakes. Either I'm making a mistake or they're making a mistake. Exactly. Don't, I, you know what I think it is? I think the academics know the truth, and they're afraid to tell the people, and the pastors are ignorant, and they can't tell the people. 
And so I think there's the, some of that too. So the people, there's are some, there's some fan. freedom. There's some fear. I, I, I suspect there's people in the the admissions office at, at George Fox. Says, oh man, don't go out in public and say that because it makes it harder to recruit students. But we're recruiting students like gangbusters. So I, you know, I don't care. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, why do you think it's a myth? Why do you think the older? Why, why do you think there was not a global or a local flood? Can you give like one reason just for each? Actually, I believe there's all kinds of local floods. What do you mean a local flood? A local well, flood that the killed off flood, everybody? The local I mean. flood idea, like reasons to believe, old earth group, they think all the humans were in one area, so there was a local flood that killed all the humans okay, in that okay. area. And there, then know, I certainly don't believe in that kind of local flood, because human beings were spread across the face of the earth for a long, a long time ago, and so any floods that we've had, and we've had lots of local floods, okay, have only killed off certain people. Okay, that's a good reason. And, then, and why not a worldwide flood? I don't think there's enough water. <laughs> but I, you know, I don't know enough about geology. I mean, I read the geologists. That's why. Okay. So, what do you think about the academic ability of somebody? What What do you think about their reasoning process when they say, "I'm a Christian. I believe there's a worldwide flood." Mm -hmm. Do you think that person should be corrected and educated? I think we should openly debate it, like what we're doing now. Do you think it's a valid debate to have, or is it obvious? I'm pretty well convinced. But, as you say, we ought to be open to evidence. If people can pre present evidence, this fellow with the, the uh, orange sheet here says that there's evidence, mm -hmm. well, I ought to look at it. Okay, but see, you know, as an atheist, I would, I would be upset with atheists who are trying to make some kind of major point that's way off target. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and it seems like as Christians, here's Christians saying there's a worldwide flood, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of very scientifically, I would say, naive and ignorant. And it seems like the Christians in academia are like, they just, they just keep their mouth shut. They don't want to confront it. They don't want to, because they don't want to make waves or something. Uh, okay, so. Do you agree with that? Um, I'm trying to figure out what's the educational problem here in Christianity. This is scientific thinking. This is, this is what I'm saying. This is the importance of scientific thinking. How could Christians so learn critical thinking when in the church they're steeped in, in things like this? So your question is, why should I not make it my business to change people's uh, beliefs about this? Yeah, especially when, the, especially when most Christians have the wrong idea, what you just said earlier. Because I've got a lot more important things to do. <laughs> but you're a teacher. That's your job, is to teach uh, people. I, I'm not teaching science. I'm teaching good philosophy. Um, now, I'm quite happy. You know, the, the friend is here. Now, it's important in this situation here, you're, you're deliberately trying to cause division between the two of us. No, I'm pointing out a serious problem. Yes, yes, and so and, I want to... And the I Christians wanna... say, I don't want to talk about it because it's a division, but it shouldn't be a division. The Christians who are smart should say, look, this is ridiculous, don't do this. No, there that, that be a is completely unfair. Out. You're saying that this man is not smart. I'm that saying, is completely no, unfair. No, I'm saying scientifically... You just say it. Scientifically, it's ignorant, scientifically. Right. That's a fact. Ignorance is a different thing than saying somebody isn't smart. It's scientifically incorrect, though. I mean, okay. it's scientifically... Just be more careful. It's scientifically... Uh, it's a, it should be embarrassing. No. You should be embarrassed that your Christian community has this, but instead, the academics are saying, I'm not going to say anything because it's divisive. And I'm, now I'm, I'm being accused of being divisive because I'm bringing this up because well, it's I'm, something you want to keep under the covers. I, no, I don't keep it under the covers. I confront my students with it quite often. Some of them are here. You can, you can speak to them. We tr I try to bring people along. People are sometimes um, slow to understand the truth, slow to look at, at evidence, slow to think critically. And there is this widespread belief that somehow if we don't, if we think critically and use the best intelligence that we've got, that somehow this will bring us away from the truth. And that's why my friend Mark McLeod Harrison confronts the freshman. If Christianity isn't true, Jesus doesn't want you to believe it. Follow the truth no matter what. Okay, one point I want to make too is I think you're making a mistake of what you accuse the atheists of doing. You're saying the atheists make this, these science reasons and really there's philosophical reasons and maybe these atheists are philosophically naive. I, I think you're, you're continuing this uh, bad situation of having science versus philosophy. And that's why I said this is not science versus religion. This is scientific thinking versus magical thinking. Now, when you do philosophy, you mean it sound like philosophy and science are two different things. Philosophy has to be built on solid science. That when I disagree have, with. 
I completely disagree. You know, listen, for a deductive argument, for example, you have a premise. That premise needs to be true for your whole argument to be true. If you don't, if you are scientifically ignorant or naive, you're going to have bad premises. And no, for let's, bad say, premises, let's be precise here. For an argument to be sound, mm -hmm. the premises must be true mm -hmm. and the inferences must be valid. Let's not use la lazy language. Okay, the, the point is, if your premise is scientifically wrong, you're con unsound, your conclusion is going to be wrong. Right, if, if, the, if the premise of an argument is not true, then even though the conclusion is validly deduced, Mm -hmm. It isn't necessarily right. true. And so, for example, the worldwide flood, they have logic for what it is, but it's based on premises that are faulty science. So science and, and philosophy are deeply tied together. That very, I would very agree deeply. With. That you I would agree with. No, you made it sound like there's some kind of science versus philosophy problem here, and I'm trying to say they're integrated. And, and you made it sound like you can get truths from philosophy that you can't get from science. Exactly, so, yeah. My main point, though, is that philosophy depends on science, and even it uh, uses science, but it doesn't depend on science in every case. Most For instance, of, most, the, most the, of it, most of it does. Oh, all right. And like the logical fallacies, <laughs> like logical fallacies, for example, they, they show how they go astray. I mean, for example, the appeal to ignorance. Ad ignorantium, we say. Yeah, appeal to ignorance. I mean, that's that's faulty logic based on. No, it's, it's a common fallacy. It's been recognized by for centuries. Sure. So anyway, my point is that I think most, most philosophy is built on science and scientific reasoning. I, I, I'm not saying it's science versus philosophy. I'm saying good philosophy depends on good science. Okay. And that's why there's a lot of bad philosophy, because of bad science. So, and, and you made it sound like you can get, get some truths through philosophy as if you can get it through philosophy without science. But I think science or scientific reasoning, scientific thinking, I'm expanding it to scientific thinking impacts all of philosophy. There is no philosophy versus scientific thinking. Philosophy is scientific thinking. Scientific thinking requires philosophy. Philosophy is scientific thinking. That's a direct quote. A scientific. Are you going to stand by that? Scientific thinking in, involves philosophy. They're not two different things. They're not two different things. I'm trying to say they're not two isolated things. They're, they're, not, they're intertwined. Ah, very good. Now, now, I can, now I can agree with you. Okay, but you made it sound like there's things you can get from philosophy that you can never get from science. Exactly, or, that's true. As if science has nothing to do with philosophy. No, no. Okay, oh, good. We agree that science is instrumental in philosophy. Sometimes. Oh, I can agree with that. Sometimes. I, I can't think of a case. Okay, um, like I said, I'm going beyond science. I'm saying scientific thinking. Which, in, which entails good philosophy, so, okay, that's it. Okay, so now um, they will switch roles, and Dr. Smith will be in the driver's seat. Okay, just a minor point. Um, on your list of logical fallacies, you appear, include agner, ad, ignorantium, ad ignorantium, which is a classical fallacy, but you also include appeal to emotion. Usually we call, call it ad misericordium, the appeal to pity, but um, I suppose there might be other appeals to emotion, so those, that also I'll accept as a fallacy. But it's simply not the case that the cumulative case arguments are a fallacy. There are lots of cumulative, cumulative case arguments that are perfectly good uh, logic. Um, now, uh, the, the main point for you is um, you honor science, you want to honor scientific thinking, which you want to confuse with good philosophy, and then you back away from it, and then you do it again, and then you back away from it. So when it comes to non-natural truths, are there any? I, now, I was well, forced to go okay. too fast. I'll go, if you want, I'll well, go no, back no, no, through I'm, the four options that you have. Well, what you're trying to do, I think, is make the... Um, conversation really abstract and you want to go into morals, which is... Well, exactly. That's philosophers do that all the time. That's but, our you know, bread and I, butter. But I think the most more interesting thing about supernatural things is things, the real bread and butter things, like ghosts. Do ghosts exist? I mean, most people probably think ghosts exist. And it's like, well, let's, um, let's talk about, you know, reading the future and, and the real things no, instead of... Let's talk like, about whether... No, now, I'm in charge now. Okay. So, let's, <laughs> I, I'm, I don't think people give a rip about ghosts, but I think people yeah. do, give, do care about whether or not they should treat their neighbors decently. And is that a duty that you have that you have whether you like it or not? It's true. Is it a duty? 
I think basically um, good and bad comes down to what's beneficial or what's painful, okay? And so it, it's kind of obvious you don't hit people because you don't want people to hit you. Do unto others as you want them to do unto you. Confucius said it, what, 200 years before Jesus? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is obvious kind of stuff. It, it's, it's not some kind of law floating out there. But it's not floating out there, but is it true that you should treat your neighbor decently? I think that would make for a better society. Yeah. As far as, so yeah. now, our, now, now we're, we're, you're quickly moving into... But did you say, some, is it true? Yeah, I'm asking you, is it true? I don't think that's really appropriate to say, is it true or not? That's I think, what I thought you, you would come to. No, if you said, is it good or bad? That's a different question than that's is right. it true. Is it true? That, and this I can is say it. it's good, but I, I can't. Now, truth is, is it true? No, this that. is where, no, this is 1936, all over again, folks. Language, truth, and logic. A.J. Ayer went down to Vienna. He got to his first in, in, in indoctrination by the Vienna Circle. He became a logical positivist. Look it up, language, truth, and logic. When he comes to moral trouble, moral issues, he says, stealing is wrong. Well, we can define what stealing is. We can define what we will do to you if we catch you stealing, but there is no sense. It literally is not meaningful to say stealing is wrong because the only things that are meaningful are scientific things. I can tell you why. Okay, go ahead. There's three basic principles I think morality should be based on. Okay, one is consequentialism. You look at the consequences for good or bad. Another one is reciprocity. Mm -hmm. What you do, what you want to other people to do. You, you do to other people what you want them to do to mm -hmm. you. And the other one is individual rights. In other words, let people do what they want as long as they don't bother okay, you. Okay, let's take the second one. Uh, that you should do to other people what they do to you. Yeah. Is that true? See, I think you're asking the wrong question. No, no wait. I, I think, think that's good. exactly the question that people want to know because there are people who don't believe it, by the way. No, no, they want to know is it good or bad behavior. They don't say is it true or false. Is it good or bad behavior? That's a different question. Well, I think it, the question is, is it true? Well, I don't get it. I would is say it that, true I would say whether or, or not we believe it's true? Because there are some people who will say, I don't believe it's true. That's and, right. And the positivists will quickly say, you see, the way out of this problem is to say it's neither true nor false. It's just a matter of your emotion. Yeah, see, I believe somebody may have different principles, and so for them it may not be good. And I would say I have different principles, and for me it's good. Now let me tell you why my principles are more superior to yours. I would go into the underlying principles. Who has better principles? Which principles are better? Aren't the, the, I mean, you're hiding from the fact that your principles, if they are better, they are better because they are true. No, no, not at all. I just said better because of consequentialism, reciprocity, and individual free rights. Not at all because they're true. Why, is, why are those three things important? Because I told you earlier that it leads to more peace and pleasure. And why is peace and pleasure a good thing? Because everybody wants a hug and nobody wants to get hit in the face. I mean, it's kind of obvious. Wait a second. Moral truths come from what we want? Survival. For a peaceful society, yeah. People, everybody wants to live in peace. Now, this comes back to the very Most good, the, the, the hypothesis of evolutionary uh, um, epistemology. We have evolved in certain ways to believe certain things because it's good for passing on our genes. That's not my that, argument, though. Yeah. No, but it's a pretty good theory. I mean, because it's the way the, the uh, uh, evolutionary epistemologists uh, explain how it is that we have propensities to believe certain things. So you're arguing with somebody else at that point, then. That's not me. Okay, so you're, you're, that's one of the four options. I keep seeing you wavering between the first three, and you can't seem to settle down and say, this is what I believe. Uh, I just can I put my thing back up and run through them for him? Well, no, I just said there's three basic principles. About and you how refuse to, have to tell me whether or not they are true. I said it's not applicable a question. So then they are not true. There's a not applicable question. We're back to positivism. These things are neither true nor false. They can't be true no, or false. I'm saying it's like if you ask me what color are they, I'd say it doesn't make sense to ask what color it is. It, it doesn't make sense to ask if it's true. I think you should ask is it good or bad, and then you look at principles to see what, like what, what you find. I, I would love to put up the three questions. Okay. Um, <coughs> get this going. Come on. Let's back up. Here are the non-naturalist, these are the, the naturalist options as I see them. Um, there are no non-naturalist truths. You keep coming back to that, Bernie, but you can't seem quite face into the reality of positivism. Only scientific statements are meaningful. Ignore all others. There are no non-natural truths, and now we're applying this to morality. Normative moral judgments express human preferences only. Some people like it, some people don't like it. End of story. The problem here is, and we could go on for a couple hours about this, positivism is self-contradictory, and so it died, 
and the motivism is false, and so it died. So the third option, explain how people come to believe non-natural truths. And here I think there's some really cool stuff going in, in, in this field that I call epistemological or evolutionary epistemology. But unfortunately, even though it gives a neat explanation of what we believe, it doesn't explain why it's true. And the fourth one is to simply admit that there are non-natural truths, and that you don't want to do. Why not, Bernie? Come on. There's real non... I mean, go back to just math. Can I answer my question? Yeah, answer are there... Uh, the math ones. Do, do mathematicians discover things or invent things? Math is totally different than morality. Totally different. Well, it's a different field for sure. But they are, no, they are, no, they are both, both different categories of non-natural truths. No, there's no truths for morals. You can have different societies that have different morals, different beliefs of good, and that's why I would say, let's look at the underlying principles, and I would say, my principles are superior to your principles. So let's talk about the principles. I mean, for example, you have divine command theory. Things are right or wrong based on what God tells you. I mean, I think that's the worst possible of all. So, my principles are, my principles are better than your principles, but they're not true. Well, we can talk about why you think they're better or not. And we can talk about whether they're true. I don't think it's applicable, yeah. Okay, okay. I think uh, you need to, I mean, I recommend A.J. Ayer. You will love it. He's a wonderful writer. He, he presents positivism in all its glory. And you should get into there and, and, and discover what you truly believe. Um, all right, I'll just, I'll just summarize. First of all, I'm really happy that you all kind of came. Um, I've been a little bit mean to Bernie, but mostly because Bernie and I, are fr we've become friends through this conversation that we're having on email and other things. I enjoy it anyway, so. <laughs> yeah, so um, notice, I would reaffirm the things that we, he started with and that I affirmed and we still both of us affirm, that you ought to think well, that you ought to be open-minded, you ought to practice good thinking, and, believe, and be open to the truth, and follow the truth where it, where it leads. I don't believe in a universal flood, but if there's evidence to believe, go for it, then go for it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So now we will have around 35 to 40 minutes for questions from the audience. And my question for you both is, what do each of you think is the most convincing argument for the opposing side? And what is your response to that? Historically, straightforwardly, the most important argument against um, Christian theism is the problem of evil. Um, Bernie and I debated, debated one aspect of the problem of evil once. Um, I'm not convinced, but I know lots of people who suffer a lot, and they see lots of suffering. Um, uh, Mike, earlier, uh, spoke about his own experience with the problem of evil as a young person. I think his experience um, describes that of many, many people. And um, so I think that's probably the strongest um, naturalist, well, not naturalistic, but anti-theistic argument that you can get. Okay. Um, for me, it's kind of difficult because I don't really think there's any good arguments for Christianity at all, but... Um, <laughs> You know, obviously, Phil would say the same thing, maybe for the other side, but I, I spoke about the argument from ignorance, which, you know, a Christian would say, uh, hey, who made the Big Bang? Where would the Big Bang come from? And you say, well, you know, the laws of nature could do it. Okay, well, where those laws of nature come from? And I said, that's an um, argument from ignorance to say, nobody knows, therefore God did it. But since nobody knows, there's a possibility God did it, right? There's a possibility because nobody knows. There's a possibility he did, there's a possibility he didn't. Um, so, you know, the antidote to that is, I think, is, is, is to think, wait a minute, why are, why are evidences for God based on ignorance, things we don't know? Why, why can't we look at things we do know, such as a DNA code and things like that? Bart Rask is here, he wrote a book about DNA code and why he thinks it disproves evolution. That's a good thing, that's a good, if you're a Christian, that's a good argument to go down, I think, because you're saying, sorry, uh, he's, I don't know what I said. He's, he's for creation, he's against evolution, and he says the evidence is against evolution. Um, so that's a good way to go. We got evidence, and how is that against my point? But instead, the Christians go for these unknown things and say that's evidence. But I would say that's probably the best thing they have going. Maybe that's why William Lane Craig seems to use that as his number one argument. It's the best they got. 
Um, so anyway. Okay. Well, I guess first of all, um, I want everyone here to know and understand uh, that the questions that Bernie is asking, many of the questions that Bernie is asking are exactly proper questions. You're right. Um, and so people who are doing critical thinking should be seeking the answers to the questions that Bernie has asked. Uh, honestly, I'm very disappointed in the professor. Uh, he's defending something, but I don't know what it is. It's not a part of my faith. I think I have a faith that's reasoned, reasonable, and based on many things. Uh, but just for the two of you both, please, uh, uh, for seekers of truth, uh, there are two things that are commonly recognized, I think, among thinking people in academia, Sir, science, or whatever it may question, be. And uh, the two this things. This is a Q and A. Um, can you please state your question? I'm doing that right now. Thank you. There are two things that are uh, used to establish uh, truth. One is causality, and one would be truth tests. Bernie, I didn't hear you say anything about causality. I, I felt like you were running from it. I didn't hear any truth tests. Professor, I didn't hear anything about causality. I didn't hear anything about truth tests. These are the things that you really should be looking for. I think here is kind of up, up. I'd like to hear what you say about what truth tests do you have and what, uh, and what do you deal with? How do you deal with causality for both of you? Because I think those are key things that people, that we understand. If you're going to look for truth, these are the things you look for. For both of you, I'm, I'm asking the question. Both of you. By causality, do you mean like what caused the Big Bang or what? Is that what you mean? Is that what you mean? Okay. Is that what you mean by that? It's a general principle you apply all all across the board. For example, Hawking uh, uh, has recently said, "Oh, well, God is not necessary because now we understand how from the from the mass, the physical laws, we how we understand how the stars cooked and everything else." Mm -hmm. But for a thinking guy, he should be able to say, "Wait a minute." What's the cause of the existence of physical laws? So a, a causality applies to everything. Where did the physical laws come from even before the Big Bang? Causality, you have to deal with it uh, in every area, not just mm -hmm. in a flood, okay? Yeah, and my answer was, which I, I, I said I think uh, a couple times, is that this is something we don't know, and that's, that's, that's why it's called the argument from ignorance, is where you try to say, nobody knows, therefore God. Nobody knows uh, the Big Bang. What's birthed it? Are there multiverse or not? Nobody knows this stuff, and so this is not evidence for God if you don't know. And God is not an answer, God is a mystery. So say, oh, God did it, that's the same thing as saying magic did it or whatever. I mean, it's not really even an answer. This and, is, truth, and truth tests, both causality and truth tests. Who's, uh, who's the next question? You're well, we'll give Bill a chance, I think. Um, actually, there's a, a, a lot of philosophical work on causality. I'm not an expert in it. Um, basically, we believe that everything that is, it's always right to ask what caused it. Um, however, in um, classical Christian theism, we see that God. We say that God is the only self-causing thing, um, and that drives people like Bernie and atheists uh, or agnostics crazy. That God would be in a different uh, metaphysical category than everything that exists. But we shrug our shoulders and say, well, we've said that from the beginning. God created everything. God is not the created thing. He's the creator, or however you describe God. Um, so God is um, the uncaused cause. Now, that's Aristotle, but uh, Christians like Aquinas picked up on it and used it. Um, I don't see any reason not to. The truth tests. Oh, tests for truth. Um, Bernie ran, th ran through some. There's all kinds of tests for truth. Logical consistency, good evidence, um, the lack of counter evidence, lack of self-refutation. This is the problem that he keeps slipping into by his move into positivism. Um, so there are all kinds of truth tests that we use in different ways. For Bernie, just Bernie and I have debated several times. My name is Bart Rask. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, sports medicine specialist, Degree in microbiology, reviewer for a medical journal. So I have training in differentiating science from pseudoscience. And my question for Bernie is, uh, would you acknowledge that the belief in evolution is also a belief in the supernatural? And I'll explain. I believe the belief in, I believe, yeah, I know you know it. But in light of the data, uh, my belief is that naturalists also believe in the supernatural. They just don't realize it. Uh, belief in evolution, the Big Bang, are pseudosciences and they're just rationalized by naturalists to think that they're science. The reason they're not science is because they, there's no empirical evidence 
for example, that a simple creature can evolve more biochemical systems and organ systems. That's never been shown. The co-founder of the Freethinkers believes in empiricism. Yet there's no empirical evidence that a creature can evolve more organ or biochemical systems. And it's untestable because it allegedly occurred over millions of years, so it doesn't meet the definition of science. Yet naturalists believe in it. Would you acknowledge that in light of the lack of empiricism and testability of a phenomenon that allegedly occurred over millions of years does not meet the criteria of science, therefore is a belief in the supernatural, just like Christians? Um, oh, and if you do, why do you think that evolution is a science in light of its lack of testability of something that occurs over millions of years and in light of the lack of its empirical evidence? Yeah, so I think at the heart of that is at, at some point, um, Science is in the business of explaining phenomena, and you know, at some point, there's all there's these different hypotheses, and and as far as falsification and, and how to think, and basically the job is to figure out which hypothesis is the best. And you know, for example, uh, humans thought God caused um, earthquakes at some point. Then there's different uh, hypotheses put forward to that. There was no evidence for it. Somebody came up with plate tectonics. There was no evidence for it at first maybe, and then people gather the evidence. And so like right now, you know, there's, there's ideas about maybe there's a multiverse, maybe there's no evidence. So that's a, maybe you could say it's a philosophical thing, but it's an extrapolation from known science. So I agree with you, there could be scientific theories that have no scientific grounding whatsoever, like string theory. They don't know if it's true or if it's just math games at this point. But it's called science because it comes out of logic and reasoning, and it doesn't come out of like divine inspiration, like I have this idea because God told me. That's the difference between religion and magical thinking versus scientific uh, thinking. But Bernie, what differentiates religious thinking from scientific thinking if it's not empirical evidence, your testability? Mm -hmm. That's a defining feature. Well, the empirical evidence leads to the hypothesis, and that's what all the science is about. All the scientific theories are based on some kind of reason. And the magical thinking and the religious thinking, it's not. It's based on God did it by magic. But it's totally is, different. But what is the reason that makes evolution scientific and reasonable, if not, since there, how can you call it reasonable if there's no empirical evidence to put it in that category? How do you know it's not supernatural? Well, I would say there's a lot of empirical evidence. Like, for example, I disagree with you about the DNA. I think the DNA, when you look at genomics across multiple organisms, you can see the footprints of descent. And so I would say there is evidence for that, even though we can't see species in the lab, you know, changing. So I, I think there is evidence for it. Uh, next question. We should, we should probably give Phil a chance to respond to on, just so it's not one-sided. What do you think? Should Phil respond to yeah. the question? If, if, you, if you would like to, please, Professor. I don't know if I have anything useful to say. So, since I don't know. Well, uh, okay. Next question, please. Um, can I address you as Dr. Phil? No, Phil. <laughs> There's a Dr. Phil who's polluted the land. <laughs> um, I, I think I understand. I'm not an intellectual, but I think I understand your premise that more or less absolutes are, are an evidence for the supernatural. Um, and I want to ask you a question. Um, I accepted Jesus as my savior when I was 14. I went to Multnomah Bible College and got a degree in theology and was a missionary in Europe. And then just about four or five years ago, I, I deconverted because I believed the evidence wasn't there for what I believed in for 46 years. And one of the things that we were taught at Multnomah that was very evil was a thing called situational ethics or moral relativism. I believe both are very similar. And one thing I was worried about was that Christians, and I used to argue this, well, the atheists have no moral absolutes. They have no moral, <laughs> if, if they don't have God, where do they get their moral standards? And there was one thing you put up on the screen there that, that I questioned. I think you were using, now I'm, I may have this wrong, so correct me if I do. Is stealing wrong? And I think it was kind of a rhetorical question, and the answer is no, it is yes, it's wrong. But, I mean, if there's somebody here with a gun about to murder somebody and you steal their gun, mm -hmm. that would make that thing actually probably the stealing the right thing to do. And, mm -hmm. you know, you can say the same thing about lying. And, Sir, can you please get your so, question? So the question is, do you agree that we can have 
that I can be a moral person without having a God or a sacred scriptures to create that sort of abs moral absolute for me? That's a really helpful question. Thank you. Um, <laughs> First of all, uh, on the exception to stealing is wrong, if there is an exception, and I certainly believe there are, uh, to a, a moral rule like stealing is wrong, the exception is caused by some other moral truth that in this particular case, the general rule of don't steal is overridden by a more important moral truth. In either case, you still have a moral truth. Do I believe that atheists have, have, believe in moral truths? Yes. Um, some of the best, not only do atheists believe in moral truth, many of them um, live out moral truth quite well. And when they're clear-headed, I mean, this afternoon I was doing an argument in my intro to philosophy class against relativism, um, and I said, look, you're, you might be suspicious that I'm against relativism because I'm a Christian. Okay, the argument I'm going to give you is John Keeks's argument in the book called Facing Evil. John Keeks is by no means a Christian, and his argument is completely... I mean, he, he's a really fine argument against relativism and in favor of what he calls um, deep prohibitions. There are things that are deep in our human nature that are moral truths. So that is only one feature of the universe that is well explained by the existence of God. Now, I had, I thought, coming in 20 minutes, but it turned out 10, um, to present one feature of an argument for the existence of God. I think there are many, many others. and so. I hardly expect somebody to be persuaded uh, that God exists or that the supernatural is real by one simple argument, but it's a opening of the door that you, where you have to weigh this argument along with all the other arguments. It's a holistic judgment that you make on the basis of many different things in your life that you have to decide. Can I have just a quick comment on that too? Yeah, really quick. Um, I just wanted to say too, like Wes, I was a born again evangelical Christian for 25 years, and so I know what it feels like to be led by God or think you're led by God. And one thing that bugged me too is like, you know, you think about Hitler, and if, if they came to your house and said, "Do you have any Jews there?" It's like, okay, well, I'd probably lie, but then I'd have to ask for forgiveness for lying. But it's like you don't have to ask for forgiveness for lying. It's the right thing to do to lie in that case. But for Phil, it's a problem because lying is a moral truth and it's wrong. It's, you know. You shouldn't have to feel guilty about something like that. It's just, Bernie, did you hear what I said? I think you're misunderstanding. Okay. Okay. Next, next question, please. Uh, Hi, this question is for Phil. Hi. Hi. Okay, great. Um, I mostly had a question about uh, the non-natural truths that yeah. you were talking about. Yeah. So when I think of that, I, I tend to think of like Plato's forms and other things like that as more ideas in our minds. And since we are really good at seeking out patterns. I think that's part of the discovery of mathematics or the, are we, are we discovering it or are we creating it? Um, but since we are so good at, at noticing patterns and seeing different things, I mean, how is non-natural truths any different than ideas in our minds, which are natural because they're part of us and we're natural? That's a, a really, that's a helpful question. It helps make the, the point that I was making crystal clear. If the things that we m make up in our minds are just that, then they are natural truths. I and mean, you don't have to believe in non-natural truths. So mathematics is just made up. But that, that comes with this connotation that something made up in your mind is somehow just like not true or it's less than other things. And, and it, it's not, maybe it's a beautiful part of who we are. Maybe it's, it's, maybe it's why humanity has been so good at being able to do so many wonderful things and so many evil things at the same time. It, it doesn't lessen okay. the beauty of it. But as I say, the argument for non-natural truths, and in the particular ones, the moral truths that I'm uh, I think we can all observe, are well explained by the existence of God. You are trying to see, and I said it even at that time, I'm open, and we ought to be open to possible other explanations. I would observe, this is just a fact, that virtually all mathematicians would say we're discovering truths and not inventing them. 
Bernie, uh, would you like to comment? Yeah, I would. I mean, uh, this is mind-boggling that moral values depend on God because some of the most gross immoral laws ever, moral laws are in the Bible, like in the Old Testament, about killing a, a woman if she's thought to be a, not a virgin on a wedding night. I mean, these things are gross. And, and this comes from a God? God said this? I mean, th this is this is insane. Hi, my name is Chad, and I have a question for Phil. Yeah. Okay, so you say that Noah's Ark is a myth, right? Yeah. So what about all the other stories, like um, Adam and Eve, for example, like, like Noah's Ark is crazy, like the flood it destroys the world, and all those animals on the boat. Now, wait a second. We just agreed a second ago that it was a myth. Yeah. And now you said that it's crazy. Yeah. Is that the same thing? Like, just the thought of it, like... The world being destroyed and by this loving God who loves you so much and then just destroys the world and what about all those other nice people in the world well uh, maybe uh, the world it's crazy it's for God's standard. now some people <laughs> you'll have to understand some people take this story to be literally true and they say that God is righteous in his judgment on people I think it's not literally true and that makes people very upset because they think I don't believe the Bible. I do believe the Bible, uh, but I think it's a matter of how you understand the Bible. And you're raising the kind of questions that people need to raise to understand the Bible well. Mm -hmm. But you need to be more careful about your language. When you, you say something... Adam and Eve. Uh, oh. Yeah, I'll, 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 okay, so I also wanted to say that you said it was a myth, right? Yeah. So what about all the other stories, like, no, like Adam and Eve? Like, do you think that was a myth? Uh, yes, I do. So, like, what other myths do you think there are in the Bible? Well, there's a myth, uh, there, there are lots of them. There's a story of a donkey that uh, um, um, talked back to the prophet and told him what he should be doing. And there are myths of uh, trees that are talking and all kinds of things. So you don't really believe much in the Bible? No, I didn't say that at all. Well, a lot of, that, a lot of the stories in the Bible are kind of like that. There are stories in the Bible like that, and we have to ask, what is the Bible teaching when it says these things? Okay. Yeah, my question is for Bernie Deller. Um, so you talk a lot about like the need for empirical evidence being true. Is there empirical evidence that to improve that that is true? So can empiricism prove itself true? The, the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. Um, the reason why science caught on and is so is because it's successful. It feeds on itself. It's a positive cycle because it works. It brings us more information, and the information. I mean. You know, we learn from science even how to improve the scientific method. For example, like I said about pills, does this pill really cure anything? They found out that, wow, we, you know, this invention of the double-blind test, just to make sure there's subjectivity removed on that. The idea of the placebo, you know, there's, it, it basically, the, the success is the validation of it. Right. And I, I would say on the opposite side, the religious, you, you should see the religious failing over time because God is the answer to things and that shrinks back as science progresses, too. Right, I mean, you can, I, I'm not, I'm a Christian, right? I go to George Fox University, I'm a philosophy student. But, <laughs> sorry, Phil. Um, <laughs> the cat is out. The cat is out. Um, no, but I don't justify my belief in God based on like, oh, well, I don't understand something, therefore, oh, God must feel like a God of the gaps thing, right? But I'm not gonna try to justify that now, but I can't see a way with like empirical proof, with the scientific method that proves itself true, and can you actually even use that? Because there's a lot of arguments in philosophy that say that empiricism isn't necessarily true in all cases. Well, the point is there's nothing better, though. I mean, what can you offer that's better than that? It's been very successful, and it's, it, the success is outstanding. I mean, if you look at the um, curve of technology, I mean, it's, it's a logarithmic growth almost. I mean, it's... That's fine. I mean, it, I'm not arguing against science. that as for science, but there mm -hmm. are non-natural truths in the world, like, like math or like morals and things like that. I don't think those, I don't, I see that as part of scientific thinking. Math is scientific thinking. It's not some kind of super, super, there's nothing supernatural about math. Right. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing supernatural as like ghost-like about math, right? But there are things that are based in logic that aren't necessarily naturally true. As in, like what Phil was talking about, like these moral truths or these ethereal math truths, like imaginary numbers that we 
but you can't actually nail down with your empirical Well, the only reason why we believe these numbers and everything is because it empirically works out. Sure. That's why I'm saying, like, string theory, they don't know if it's true or not because there's no evidence for it yet. I think that's a mis mis uh, representation of the progress of math. Imaginary numbers were invented hundreds of years before the, the first practical use of, in, in quantum theory was found for them. I know, but I mean, string theory now is, is a well-established branch of math too. But like, they they don't know if it's true or not. They don't. They don't know if it applies to the universe. They don't know if it applies to reality. I mean, they're trying to. They're using it to model. Subatomic things, I, I believe, with string theory, but strings. Yeah, I was. Yeah, one, of the, one of the things we haven't been um, exploring yet that I'd be interested in is that as science evolves and we discover, make new discoveries, I'm thinking, for example, there's been a lot of recent study about, as far as brain theories, but the whole concept of the science of compassion. Mm -hmm. People have now been saying that what they used to say was a supernatural experience, an experience relating from God to God, and Karen Armstrong's been a good proponent of this, is now saying, according to some of the brain theory, this was experiencing compassion. So when you thought you were having a supernatural experience, you thought you were having this revelation from Jesus while having a conversion experience, some of the brain science has been kind of deconstructing this and wondering what you might have been actually experiencing. might not have been you know, the power of the Holy Spirit. Can you skip your question? But that, that's what I'm asking if you guys have because we haven't really got into this subject. That's a slightly different subject. But I'm wondering if any of we would want to address that. Yeah, I think something interesting there is this. I, I think like less than 50 or 60 years ago, there was very little animal studies. And now, too, you look at animals, and they see morality, basic morality, and communication, and awareness, all kinds of things in animals, too. And you know that kind of contradicts the old theological idea about we're made in God's image. And, and it's like, well, what is God's image? And you know, it used to be that we could love, or we have morals, or all this stuff. And then we find all these other animals have rudimentary aspects of that. But our, we go a little further because our brains are more complex. Um, I don't know the recent research that you're referring to. I do know the, the basic paradigm of uh, what's called computational theory of the mind, that everything in the mind can be reduced to uh, the lowest level of the mind. I'm deeply skeptical. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the gap between the higher level mental functionings and the lowest level um, neurological functionings is just enormous. Mm -hmm. um, even with the massive uh, improvements that we've had in neuroscience in the, in the last couple generations, it's a long way off to try to get that kind of a... And it, so it's really a promissory note by the reductionists. We'll figure it out eventually. Um, I, I'm deeply skeptical. I certainly won't live that long. Because there has been a whole lot of research on compassion as of late. That's why I was wondering. It's been pretty extensive. And that would be very interesting stuff, and I don't know anything about it. Thank you all for your questions. Marco? Yeah, so this is officially the end of the debate. Uh, we were scheduled to end at 9, and it is 9.07. But um, we can be in this room until 9.30. We'll be cleaning up, and you can talk to the speakers. Um,